Okay, so um, yeah, let's let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to another webinar by DigiShares. My name is uh, Jonas and I'm uh, today's host. Um, today's webinar will be about real estate tokenization and NFTs. Uh, we have, as always, invited industry leading experts to join us who will introduce us to NFTs and their relation to real estate tokenization. But before we have a closer look uh, on today's presenters and the program, let us just uh, cover the rules of engagement. So first and foremost, if you have a question for a specific speaker while he or she's on, please add that question to the Q&A and please remember to specify who the question is for. So the name of the presenter followed by your question. After each presentation, if we have any time left, we can then take a few questions. And if not, we'll try to save the good questions for the panel at the end. And please note that sometimes if our speakers have time to spare, um, they'll enter the Q&A after the presentation to answer any questions you may have. If you have any general inquiries, um, feel free to use the chat. Um, our moderators will uh, sit ready to answer any questions you may have. Also, if there are any technical issues during the webinar, such as a speaker being muted, a screen not being shared, etc., please notify us using the, the chat. Okay, so now that we have covered uh, the rules of engagement, let us move on to an introduction of today's presenters. So first off, we have Klaus Koning. Klaus is the CEO of DigiShares, and he'll be giving us a tokenization industry status update and talk about the current traction of data shares. After Klaus, we have Vivian Fang, a Honeywell professor of accounting at the University of Minnesota, and she'll be sharing an overview of NFTs. After Vivian, we have Elizabeth Strickler, who's the director of media entrepreneurship and innovation programs and senior lecturer at the Georgia State University and she'll be talking about NFTs and digital assets. After Elizabeth, we have Adam Brown, who is the VP of Sales and Brokerage uh, Relations at Probi, and he'll be talking about real estate tokenization with NFTs. And after um, Adam, we have Jake Menner, who's the CF CFO uh, at Renewal Blocks, and he'll be presenting a case study uh, on Renewal Blocks. And then finally, after Jake, we have today's uh, last presenter, uh, Kylie Blazon, uh, who's the CCO of Stoke, and she'll present a case study on NFT versus security tokens and their utilization in real estate. Then at the webinar, as always, we'll have a, a fireside chat where today's presenters will answer some of your questions. Uh, we already have received lots of good questions, as always, but if you have a question you would like to ask the panel, please feel free to post it in the Q&A. And also please add panel followed by your question. And again, just to reiterate, if the question is targeted a specific, a specific presenter, please specify who it is. So simply type in the name of the presenter followed by your question. Okay, so um, now that we have gone through uh, today's program, I would like to um, present today's first speaker, uh, Klaus Koning. Klaus has a PhD in computer science, uh, specialized in AI and has taken out seven patents. He's a serial entrepreneur, having co-founded more than five, uh, five companies so far. And for the last five years, he has been focused on blockchain and he also co-founded DigiShares four years ago. Klaus will now give us a tokenization industry status update and shed some light on the current traction of DigiShares. So Klaus, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Um, welcome everyone here. It's a pleasure to be hosting uh, another webinar. I think our fifth or sixth so far. Uh, after this webinar, we'll take a break, start up again in August or September, um, and uh, consider new topics for uh, uh, that can be related to tokenization and uh, sort of assist us with educating and motivating the community around around us in how uh, the tokenization of real estate can be of, uh, of benefit. It can create value for society as a whole, I would say. So today we are very proud to uh, present the topic of tokenization with NFTs. 
Um, we have some great speakers here, especially I'm, I'm eager to hear the presentation from Probi. Probi is one of the experts in the space and maybe the leader. Um, from a DigiShares perspective, we are not so advanced in the space of NFTs, and I will present a slide and dig a little bit deeper into this uh, uh, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have Probi today, and we have two other leaders in the space giving their perspectives on how NFTs can provide value, uh, especially in relation to tokenization. Uh, we also have two uh, white label partners that I'm eager, eagerly awaiting to hear about myself, about two concrete projects taking tokenization to the to the uh, to the world. Uh, so that should be exciting. Um, on our side, um, we still see an expanding industry. Uh, we are doing what we can to help uh, help it grow. We did a masterclass in Miami, Miami last week focused on real estate tokenization together with security token market and security token advisors. Um, it was uh, quite successful with more than 50 real estate developers present. We're going to repeat this at the end of May, May 31st in, in Vienna. And then we have two similar events, two, two other masterclasses, in, one in September, Las Vegas, and one in uh, October in uh, San Jose in California. We uh, see increasing uh, growth and increasing traction. Uh, we signed up 11 clients since the last webinar in about one month. Um, what is interesting and also sort of motivation for today's uh, webinar is that an increasing number of our clients speak about NFTs and would like to sort of uh, use NFTs in relation with a business concept. So we as a company and, and we as a, an industry, I think, need to know about it and need to know how it, it's used and how it provides value. So that's sort of really the, the, the reason for the, for, the, uh, for the event or for the topic today. Um, I'd like to show a few slides here, uh, if I can figure out how to share. Just a second. The first one here is related to the industry status. So of course we are keeping track of tokenization from an industry perspective, how it develops and what are the trends that we see. Uh, we have issued a couple of industry reports on the topic, and there's actually a couple of new industry reports forthcoming from us that will dig deeper into this over the next few months. Um, overall, we see an increasing amount of regulation. So the space is getting more and more regulated. For us, from our perspective, it's not so um, significant and it's not, uh, it's not uh, a critical issue in itself because we are already operating within the securities space. Anyone working with tokenization of real estate or other types of assets are already within the security securities regulation space. So it shouldn't. So, so the ongoing regulation shouldn't actually influence that much. But of course, we 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 border with crypto regulation. So you could say anything to do with crypto uh, payments, uh, payment service uh, provision. Um, uh, custody, uh, wallets, and so on that is interfacing, of course, with what we're doing is getting increasingly re regulated. So, of course, we have to be aware of this. But I think the regulation is developing in the right direction. All the regulators that we speak to are generally very positive towards the organization and, uh, and, and see the benefits. We also see the trend going towards decentralization. It can be seen to some degree from the graph in the top right corner, where we see the exchanges that are being launched, which are increasingly decentralized and where also an increasing amount of the volume is in, in decentralized exchanges. And this is something that we also believe in. And it's one of the reasons why our own real estate exchange is launched using decentralized exchange technology. We also see more private capital flowing into the markets. Um, it can be seen in the graph in the lower right corner, the first one. Um, the retail market is key to the success of tokenization. Um, the retail channel, development of the retail channel for funding of real estate projects is, is, is really important. It's, it's one of the main basic assumptions for tokenization that we want to democratize. We want to give retail investors access to invest into real estate assets. And, and, and uh, uh, from, from our perspective, it's a matter of education and uh, yeah, making them aware that it's actually now possible for them. 
crypto adoption is of course increasing as well. That's uh, no surprise, helping all of us, I think, to uh, operate uh, better in a more, more and more mature uh, ecosystem and infrastructure. We also see increasing institutional adoption. We work with an increasing number of institutional uh, companies and uh, sort of the client size that we work with is becoming larger and larger. Um, we also see as, as indicating lower here, uh, institutional investments, investments into the space. ICE, the mother company invested into T0, Morgan Stanley invested into Securitize. Um, so the institutional players are definitely looking at what we're doing and uh, want to be exposed to it. Um, on the topic of NFTs, um, we as a company haven't yet done a project with NFTs, but we're looking at it all the time and we are basically encouraged by our clients to, to, uh, to adopt it. Um, the main reason we haven't done anything yet is that we, we, we view the NFT space as essentially, or at least to some degree, non-compliant with security regulation because NFT protocols uh, are not sufficiently developed to support securities in the same way that, that security tokens protocols can do, such as ESE 1400 or ESE 1404. So we need to have NFT protocols that can fully support the requirements for securities. Um, and then, of course, we also so need to see actual value provided by the creation of the NFT itself. Typically, as we have seen it, NFTs created in the, in the real estate space, either map to the underlying title of the, comp of, of the property or the LLC or the company that owns the property. So if you want to link the NFT to the, to the title, this is very difficult to do because very few land title registries are digital and can be integrated to. So we haven't yet seen anywhere in the world where this can actually be done. Um, if you want to link the NFT to the, to the company that owns the property, we think this is quite, um, we, we, we have a hard time understanding the value that this provides because you would always, in any case, fractionalize the NFT, tokenize the NFT and, and create smaller fractions to, to get the real full value of tokenization. And you might as well uh, sort of uh, skip the creation of the NFT and tokenize the, the, the company directly. So those are some of the issues that we see in the space, but uh, we also realize there are some people much more familiar with NFTs than, than we are and looking forward to learn from them today. The last slide I, I want to present here is in relation to ESG. In the space of tokenization, something that we are starting to look at and uh, something that I think the industry is slowly starting to look at. ESG is of course related to sustainability and stands for environmental, social and governance. And uh, from a company perspective, there's, there's things we can do and there's things the industry can do. In relation to environmental concerns, we can focus on using proof of stake protocols who are not so energy demanding. We can promote green certified assets. In the social dimension, this is really where I think the industry shines because we can promote democratization, we can fractionalize, we can reduce the ticket size, we can enable the huge population of retail investors around the world to get access to real estate assets, sort of as the way for them to get access to wealth, wealth creation, protecting their savings, potentially escaping poverty and uh, closing the wealth gap. So I think this is where we can really provide huge value as an industry, but also on the governance, uh, in, in the area of governance in relation to our accountability, transparency, um, tracking and auditing, we can provide a lot of value. Blockchain is an open technology. It's immutable. Uh, it's it's a, a perfect uh, record of everything that's been going on. So it should be an, a very attractive technology for auditors, for tax departments and so on, because they can track everything and it's transparent. It also means that corruption will be much harder to do in the future if everything runs on the blockchain. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff we can do as an industry and uh, we are, we as a company are, are focused on this. So I think I will uh, end here and uh, give the word back to uh, Jonas and looking forward to the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Um, yeah, so um, next speaker up is uh, Vivian Fang. Uh, Vivian is the Honeywell Professor of Accounting at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, and her reason uh, research uh, has, among other things, uh, focused on cryptocurrencies. And she now teaches accounting classes and an MBA course on cryptocurrency and blockchain at Carlson. She's given lectures and talks on crypto topics at for-profit and non-profit organizations. And her comments on crypto-related issues frequently appear on local and national media. She'll now be giving us an overview of NFTs. Um, yeah, so without further ado, please welcome Vivian Feng. Well, hello. Thanks for the invitation and the kind introduction. My name is Vivian Fan, and I'm the Honeywell Professor of Accounting at the Carlson School of Management, University of Minnesota. And um, I have been teaching MBA class on cryptocurrency and blockchain since 2018. And I'm absolutely delighted to meet you all virtually today and share my knowledge on NFTs. What exactly is an NFT? Well, there are several ways to define NFTs depending on how sophisticated your audience is. You may simply describe NFTs as a type of digital asset because they're tokens that represent ownership of something else or more accurately tokenized digital work. In real life, then some people like to collecting antiques, paintings, or baseball cards, right? You can sort of think of NFTs as digital collectibles or crypto alternatives to physical collectibles. So if you see a digital picture and really love it and want to become the owner of this picture, you may do so by paying for a token that represents the ownership of this digital picture. You may also describe NFTs as blockchain-based smart contracts if you are speaking to a more sophisticated audience. In that sense, NFTs really boil down to lines of code, letters, and numbers written on blockchain. Now these days, it sure seems that everybody's talking about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ether. NFTs share some obvious similarities with cryptocurrencies because ownership and transactions of NFTs are also recorded on the blockchain, which as you all know, is a distributed ledger of underlying cryptocurrencies. And the two most well-known and two most well, you know, popular cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin and Ether, which account for over half of the crypto market. And most NFTs are hosted on the Ethereum blockchain. At the same time, NFTs are also clearly different from cryptocurrencies. First of all, they're not meant to be currencies. Currencies are supposed to be fungible, meaning that every unit is of equal value and interchangeable. A $20 bill is a $20 bill. You shouldn't care which $20 bill you get, right? A Bitcoin is a Bitcoin, and you shouldn't care which computer mined the coin. NFTs, on the other hand, are created to represent one-of-a-kind creative digital work, which is why they are non-fungible. Now, what can NFTs do? Collectors have been long willing to shell out huge sums of money on unique items, such as paintings, right, vintage cars. But now collectible items have moved into the digital space in the form of NFTs. You can sort of think of them as index cards that give information about books stored in the library. But like the book, the artwork, all the physical properties the tokens represent live somewhere else. And the NFT is simply a record of it, but now the thing itself. This is a snapshot I took of the top sales measured by Ether Valley at the CryptoPunks website this morning. What are CryptoPunks, right? There are about 10,000 unique collectible characters with proof of ownership stored on Ethereum. And this is also one of the earliest NFT projects. Why are NFTs valuable? Now, I'm not into baseball at all <clears throat> or collecting baseball cards, but if you are, you'll probably recognize Mickey Mantle here. Right? This particular card here was recently sold for $5.2 million. Why? Probably because of its scarcity. Right? But now collectible items and moved into the digital space in the form of NFTs, and they're arguably valuable too, at least to some collectors. Right. Um, this is one of the earliest piece digital work. Um, this piece of digital artwork named the switch 
represents a geometric form impact signature look, right? This is a high definition black and white work that's reminiscent of space photography. And this piece of work was sold for $1.4 million. And from the same digital artist, um, this, the, he created a whole series of digital work and this whole series was sold for more than $17 million last year. And of course, this signature piece, right? Every day, and this is from the artist Bebo, you know, which was sold for an incredible price of $69.3 million in March, 2021. Okay, so I guess when it comes to digital art and digital work, beauty is really in the eye of beholder and the valuation, some of the art-based NFTs really spend two markets. It covers the crypto market as well as the art market. Now, just take a quick look at the history of NFTs, right? Let's be very clear here. NFTs are not new. I would probably, since I've been teaching this class since 2018, I would probably consider colored coins, which were created in 2012 as the very first NFTs to exist because these coins are very different from each other and they're not created to be cryptocurrencies. They can be used to represent a multitude of assets, right? They're crypto assets, but they're very different from each other and designed to be so. And there are also another project, right? We talked about CryptoPunks and there is another project called CryptoKitties, which is a virtual pet game based on the blockchain Ethereum. And um, we had a boom in the crypto market in 2017 into 2018, and the market was stayed depressed for two years. Right? So CryptoKitties was also very popular in 2017. In fact, it was so popular that it clocked up the entire Ethereum network. To date, these colorful online cats have generated total sales of over $40 million and keep going up. Why were NFTs created? Okay, that's a very interesting question. And think about the difference between physical assets and digital assets. Take antique cars as an example, right? Some people are willing to spend a huge amount of money on collecting antique cars. Although it is possible to make a counterfeit, it is at least costly and time consuming to do so. But digital work, right? Digital files like images, videos, and songs can be reproduced and distributed easily online and infinitely, right? Often without any royalties being paid to the creators. So how do you stop that and pay the artists fairly? NFTs help address the problem because they act as a digital certificate of ownership. And blockchain technology makes it easier because it keeps track of who is selling and who is buying and who is owning. Right? This way it prevents unlimited reproduction or piracy and allows digital creators to collect royalties and subsequent transactions using smart contracts. At least that was the initial intent of the NFTs and why NFTs were created in the first in, in, in the first uh, uh, in, in, in the first place. And that's the ultimate value of the NFTs, the proof of authenticity when it comes to digital work. So the need is definitely there. But why are we hearing so much about NFTs now? Remember, right? The NFTs can at least date back to 2012 with colored coins and crypto kitties. So the market for NFTs ballooned in 2020, climbing to a market cap over $300 million. But before 2018, this market in the crypto space is really small, it's less than $50 million. And last year, trading in NFTs was just incredible. It spiked to more than $17 billion, according to a report from nonfungible.com. Okay. I think the, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic definitely played a big role in the NFT boom by forcing people to spend more time online and in the digital space. 
And the spike also coincides with the price hike of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Many NFTs are priced in Ether, the digital token of the Ethereum blockchain. So when Ether price goes up or Bitcoin price goes up, uh, the chances that a lot of NFTs will go up in price as well. And of course, you know, many other applications of NFTs, right? For example, NFTs can be used to represent fractional ownership of physical assets, such as real estate, which is the main theme of today's webinar. And these fractional ownership properties can be accessed through, you know, through different platforms, such as in, in the United States, we have Realty. And Realty was founded in 2019, and it offers investors from all over the world the opportunity to buy U.S. real estate through tokenized fractional ownership. And in the United States, it is possible to buy a home via NFT now or fractional mode through a third-party company. Basically, a token buyer owns a share of that company, which in turn owns some real estate. And another trend I see on the enterprise side is the tokenization of paperwork. So it helps to record paperwork on the blockchain and helps tokenize it. And since paperwork doesn't have to be interchangeable with each other, that's not a promising use of NFTs I see on the enterprise side. Okay. Um, I get a, this question a lot. Should I invest in NFTs? And I always say, well, it depends on whether you're into digital collectibles or not. It also depends on your investment preference and risk tolerance. I see some investors buy NFTs as a speculative investment, hoping to flip them at a much higher price than they originally paid. But a growing number of people are also holding NFTs long term as collectibles. We see major brands launching, you know, NFTs like NBA and Formula One, and people are also finding other uses for NFTs, as we talked about real estate, video games, and tokenization of paperwork. There are some challenges to NFTs, no question. First, does ownership alone make digital assets valuable? We don't know yet because we haven't seen a lot of legal cases challenging the ownership of NFT or digital work. It also creates some opportunities for money laundering and tax evasion because of one of a kind nature of the underlying work and the wild volatility in the price of these digital tokens. So it is possible that we will possibly have regulation coming soon to this segment of the market as well. Well, um, I'm almost running out of time. So let me just wrap it up with, with one concluding remark. I think the NFT market is still relatively young in the crypto space, but there are definitely promising projects out there, which I'm excited about. Uh, so we will just all have to wait and see. That's all I have to say today. And thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian, for a really good overview. Um... So we actually have a couple of minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to add them in the Q&A. Um, let's see here. Um, how do I tokenize artwork? Can, can you um, tell us a bit about that, Vivian? Yeah, um, I actually teach my, my students to write smart contracts, right? On Ethereum, you can just, well, first you gotta learn some programming language like Solidity. And you can launch smart contracts to tokenize artwork. Um, there are also some of the, you know, basically programmable blockchains out there that, you know, if you just type in Ethereum or other programmable blockchains or template, you should be easy, you should easily find templates that you can adapt to tokenize your artwork. Uh, I had a student who launched a series of uh, NFTs to represent digital pictures of ice cream. So it is doable um, if you, it's pretty easily adaptable, but obviously I cannot, you know, walk you through the programming um, through this webinar. Understandable, understandable. Um, yeah, um, I also see there's one, you, you did, you did 
um, touch upon it, but how can NFTs protect against piracy and infinite uh, re reproducibility of digital assets? So I think to a great extent, how, how, how do you actually make sure that, that, that the NFT is, represents ownership of whatever you're buying? It is tough, right? What the blockchain can do and what NFTs can do is to provide traceability and record of it, right? I mean, the same thing extends to physical artwork, right? If you really like Mona Lisa, for example, right? You can take a picture of it and you can reproduce it and you can hang the, the fake artwork in your living room if you'd like, right? The same thing stands for the digital work, but more challenging because digital work in itself lives in the, in the virtual space. So that makes it easier to reproduce and redistribute online. What NFTs can do is not to stop people from making a reproduction. It's more of, we at least know who did it right, and who legitimately owns it. But this ownership is still, we, it has not been legally challenged in court yet. At least in the United States, we haven't seen a lot of prominent cases yet. Right, so, but in principle, NFTs are supposedly recording the ownership of digital work, of our physical property, like real estate, right? Um, but so far, we haven't seen a lot of established legal cases saying that if you are the NFT ownership of this property, are you entitled to copyright? Are you actually entitled to the ownership? And that is something that um, we, 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 we need to see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's just uh, take one last question. I see there's there are lots of questions. So if you have time, feel free to to go into the Q and A afterwards to answer any questions. But um, so one person asking here if uh, whether they should go with Flow, Solana, or Polygon uh, when when doing NFTs. So you know with Ethereum, the gas fees are high. What would what would be your advice? I'm sorry. Uh, so oh yeah. Um, so all of these, right, a lot of these uh, blockchain you pointed out are, are at least marketed as competitors of Ethereum, right? As I mentioned that most of the NFT projects are still hosted on Ethereum blockchain uh, for a couple of reasons, because Ethereum was the very first programmable blockchain. Right. So you definitely have the first mover advantage. And it is also true that Ethereum is slower. The gas fee is much higher. Uh, Solana, right? Uh, Solana and the other uh, really prominent one, Avalanche, right? These two came out last year and they had high hopes. And especially with Solana, that the scalability, which means that how many transactions they can process in a second, right, um, definitely be Ethereum. However, the security side is somewhat compromised. And if you just search for Sonana downtime, right, and we've seen a couple of times Sonana just went down for a couple of hours and we didn't see that with the Ethereum. So when you switch the consensus mechanisms um, to, to provide higher scalability, and lower gas fees or lower transaction fees, you also have to think about the stability and security of your project. So ultimately there is a trade-off um, when you look at, when you assess some of the competitors of Ethereum. So far, Ethereum still remains the most popular, um, at least the host for NFT projects. And hopefully, when you know finish when when Ethereum finishes upgrading to Ethereum 2.0, you will expand the capacity and provide a higher scalability. That's my hope. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, yeah. Okay. So I hope to see you in the panel uh, discussion at the end. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you so much. Um, so. Next up is uh, Elizabeth uh, Strickler, who is the founding director of the Creative Industries 
uh, Blockchain Lab and Director of Media Entrepreneurship at Georgia State University. Elizabeth teaches uh, media innovation to undergraduate uh, and graduate students and works with uh, media labels and cultural icons to build web free and blockchain and NFT strategies. Her April 2021 TEDx talk is considered canonical viewing for those entering the NFT metaverse space and uh, she presents regularly on, on the topic. She holds academic positions in both uh, the business school and the College of Arts and Sciences, whereas she has received multiple grants uh, to research innovation. Her goal is to help others start businesses, tell immersive stories, and build a stronger uh, cultural economy. And she'll now be talking about NFTs and digital assets. So Elizabeth, please uh, take the stage. I think you are muted, Elizabeth. Okay. Hi. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different take uh, because uh, Vivian gave a great overview. And so, um, just go with me on this. This is um, because this is new space, I'm trying some sort of new ideas. So, really, um, just this is a thought experiment and we'll do together. Um, so, uh, yeah, I come from a, a pretty creative background where, where we have a virtual production pipeline where we create augmented and virtual reality at uh, the university. Um, and so game design, game development, and innovations within the media space. All right. Um, but the way I want to start off is to talk about um, the fact that everything in the real world IRL will be recreated in the virtual world. Um, some people refer to that as the metaverse. And in the metaverse, you will be able to do everything that you do in the real world and more or differently. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so uh, let's just, you know, a, a slightly different take on NFTs is that the internet. Uh, originally was meant to share information. And the way that that information was shared was to make a copy of it in order to share it. So this was great for consumers, but terrible for the creators of the information. And blockchain was the technology starting with Bitcoin that allowed financial data to be sent, but not copied. But that same blockchain technolo technology is now being applied to information, data other than money. And we're going to look into that. And that's what's revolutionizing the value of information. Since the creator of the digital asset can choose um, if and how and when that digital item can be copied. Um, so what am I talking about when I talk about information? Um, Vivian just talked about sort of the history of the NFT, and it starts off largely with um, images, JPEGs, um, that uh, can now be um, shown as proof of ownership and, um, you know, bought and sold and stay, you know, the ownership is tracked via the blockchain. So those are mostly JPEGs that we're talking about, but now we're starting to see that any file, which is information, also labor, uh, any file that is created, a JPEG, a .wave, a .doc, a .pdf, a .html, a .3ds, um, code, any kind, any file that contains code, any file that contains a 3D asset, um, a movie file, an, an audio file, all of those, can be turned into NFTs, basically only copyable, uh, you know, if the owner allows it. Um, and that is done through blockchain. So now we're going to try to think through why does that matter in real estate? Um, so you probably all have talked about the Howey test before. And you know, when I when the only reason why I put this because you all know way more than I do about finance, but the Howey test is 
to test whether something is a security or a utility. So a security is an investment of money uh, in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. So that's the question that, uh, you know, I wanna talk about what's a security, what's a utility and what's a property. Um, yeah, so non-fungible tokens can be um, one of these or all of these. Um, and it's, the regulations are still in transition and you all might have, realized, might have known that recently um, some uh, famous NFTs, I think they were World of Women or Boss Babes, um, they were stolen and uh, the court deemed the digital asset as property. So it's very interesting. All right, um, so just remember something very simple. Cryptocurrencies are just digital money. NFTs are digital goods. And blockchains are public ledgers or public databases of the transactions of these things that keep track of ownership. All right, but why, so, but again, let's go back. Everything in the real world is being recreated in the virtual world. We've seen an explosion of uh, real estate, digital real estate. Um, so you can make a digital twin of a city. Um, and it, you know, a lot of times what I think of um, digital twins as taking data and making it visual and 3D. Um, another digital twin of a city from a Singaporean company. Um, but this is starting with something that's unreal, um, sort of in a game engine. And, you know, will it become real or not? So sometimes things start as real assets and then become and are twinned to make a digital asset. Sometimes things start as a digital asset and are twinned to be a real asset. Um, I mean, in real estate, you know, you always start with a CAD drawing of some sort. Um, digital twin of a building. All right, so things that you can do, you know, you know, a, a fungible token is a currency like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum um, and, or even, even you know, a, a fungible item is a dollar. So those can be traded. But what's, what gets interesting, and Vivian alluded to this, is when you can put smart contracts on those digital, digital um, items. But also what's interesting in, when you create digital assets that are beyond just a still image are the ability to do simulations. So go with me for a second. I'm gonna talk about what you can do with a digital twin of yourself. And then we're gonna talk about digital twins of real estate, okay? So, because this is this stuff right now is happening um, and is very popular and um, then we'll go into real estate. Um, again, this, these are avatars. Um, and there's a quote, and I don't think I have it in my slides, but the quote is um, that 60% of uh, Gen Z and millennials think that their online reputation is more important than their in real life reputation. The older you are, the less you think that, the younger you are, the more you think that. So uh, the virtual is real, is what I started off um, this with. So when you play uh, games, and I know not everybody here plays games, you have an avatar, which is a digital twin of yourself. Um, it's, you know, it's a Sanskrit word, meaning, um, manifestation in bodily form from heaven, but uh, you are, uh, but your avatar represents yourself in the virtual world. And now fashion is being sold um, for direct to avatar. So not direct to consumer, but direct to avatar. And what's interesting is the, you know, real world does not apply. So, um, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this in a second. Um, 
whoops, <laughs> hold on. Sorry about that. Let me come back to that for a second. Um, all right, just, all right. So what's better in the real world? What's better in the virtual world? And what's better as a combination? Okay, so let's talk about real estate, a building, a piece of property, um, a smart city. Um, and let's think through how can you um, enhance the real world with a virtual asset, or how can you enhance a virtual asset with a real world thing? And so I'm gonna do something that's, oh yeah, here's the quote. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to do something uh, that I want you to be thinking about uh, real estate, but we're going to be looking at um, shoes. Okay. So, uh, and this is about utility and physical and digital. So my son went off to college recently um, and I asked him to pack for college. And the first suitcase that he came down with was this. And, um, you know, you can laugh about that because he thought that was the number one thing he wanted to take to school with him. Um, but when you look at these shoes, um, most of us have shoes that go beyond the utility of protecting our feet from the cold or from something, um, you know, sharp objects. We uh, wear shoes to um, flex, to show off to um, try to find a tribe or a group of people that we want to um, resonate with, maybe to find a mate, um, uh, to symbolize you know, uh, a certain status. There's a lot of reasons why we would um, you know, wear shoes other than things to protect our feet for beauty. So this guy, Fawocious, um, before the explosion of NFTs, was, um, did real digital paintings, but then he applied them to shoes and sold uh, the shoes as NFTs that were never going to be in real life shoes, just virtual shoes. Um, and then Gucci came along and did it. And these shoes... Uh, you can never wear, but your avatar can. And that now is not that strange. Gucci sells pocketbooks and shoes and sneakers uh, for um, in digital worlds like uh, Minecraft for as much as you have to pay for in real life um, pocketbooks. So the younger you are, the more real these things actually are. So again, um, in uh, Art Artifact, RTFKT, um, they also started making uh, digital sneakers um, and they were bought by Nike. So it's clear that this is becoming a real um, market where people truly value these things. Again, going back to the NFT, you can protect these items that you buy. Um, but one of the things that I wanna talk about is these shoes don't need to protect this person from cold or from, or this avatar, let me, let me be, uh, this avatar from cold or from uh, sharp objects. But what can these shoes do? What is the utility? that you can add to these shoes. So these shoes can have jet packs on them so that you can um, go faster in the virtual worlds. What if these shoes could have um, security on them so your wallets couldn't be, um, uh, you know, so, so your, your digital wallet couldn't be opened up while you had these shoes on because they had a security uh, code on them. Or these shoes could have a pass, an NFT token connected to them that would allow you to walk into certain metaverse uh, buildings or cities or spaces. Um, so I want you to think about the utility that can be added to uh, a real estate item like a house or a building, just like you could think about the utility of these shoes. 
And so then now um, a very popular uh, concept that's and and you know um, uh, product that's happening is what's called the fidgetal, meaning the physical and the digital. So these shoes um, and and many of the um, artifact Nike shoes now, um, you can buy the actual IRL in real life shoes. And it comes with a pair of digital shoes that you can wear for your avatar. And if you sell either one of those, the other pair must be sold together. Um, but what I think is interesting is that, you know, you can have a pair of, of shoes that you put on the blockchain and then it can have a token with it. Or it can, instead of having a token, a fungible token with it, you can have a non-fungible digital twin of the shoe that your digital that will that has utility in your digital life. And I think that the physical and the digital is very interesting um, way to think about real estate. Um, so yeah, what you know, the the what is the relationship? Right now mostly I've been talking about the the pixel, which is the um, digital asset, and the atom, which is the physical asset. But then when you put the financial component into it, that's the penny. But then when you put the labor component into it, that's the second. Because, um, you know, we the, the reason why I started off with that slide about the toast being copied is that even the smallest things that we have in our house and that we buy, we pay for. And now we're applying that to digital assets. Elizabeth? Yes. Um, just um, we are running out of time, so sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, are there questions? Um, I, I hope you can attend the panels uh, at the okay. end. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Sorry about that. I didn't, no, 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 no worries, no worries. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. really uh, insightful and exciting times. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, next up is uh, Adam Brown who's the uh, VP of sales and brokerage at, uh, and relations at Probi. Adam has been working in real estate uh, industry for 25 years and have worked alongside most of the nation's top agents and brokerages. He's passionate about leveraging a uh, new product and technology uh, in the real estate uh, transaction to make brokerages and agents more streamlined and productive. He's currently working closely with agents uh, to seem together traditional real estate and the web free. And you'll now be speaking about real estate tokenization with NFTs. So uh, please welcome Adam. Thanks, Jones. I guess when you say the nation's largest brokerage, you should probably imply that that's here in the United States. So um, those international brokers and agents. So um, I'll, I'll kind of give maybe five, 10 minutes on who Proppy is and then open it up for questions. Cause I think this crowd, as I can see from the chat is pretty engaged. And I think has a high level of crypto and web three, <laughs> uh, web three and um, crypto background. So at, at, at Proppy, we, we are a, um, we are maniacally focused on automating the real estate transaction here in the United States. It's very, uh, it's very Byzantine and archaic and on many levels. I think it's at one point we counted there are 18 different custodians of data throughout the real estate transaction. And for those of us who are passionate about Web3 and emerging technology and blockchain, we, we realize that custodians of data and um, stop gaps of data are really not great for the homeowner. And it creates a, an, an ability for there to be a lack of transparency, which I think is ultimately the most beautiful thing about Web3 and emerging technology is transparency. So we, we are maniacally focused on automating that real estate closing and transaction. We do that in a couple of different ways. We, we've we trained more real estate agents and brokerages on how crypto and blockchain will influence real estate. We've launched our own offer management transaction management platform that brokers and agents all across the country Use, use for their, their platform. Uh, we were the first company to ever NFT actual homes. So we've NFT'd several homes. We've done three homes publicly here in the, in the US. We've done a home in Kiev in 2019 that we NFT'd and sold 
from wallet to wallet using crypto. So we're the only company that's ever done that to our knowledge. Uh, we do that daily with brokers and agents. I spend about half my day talking to brokers and agents about how they can NFT their next home. We also have a um, we're all, we also have a utility token that's traded on Coinbase, PRO, our own property token. It's the first real estate token for realtors by realtors to be able to use in the automation of the real estate transaction. Uh, and then the fourth thing that we focus on is we've launched our own title and escrow company here in the states. Um, for those of you familiar, you know that most title and escrow state by state does have its nuances, uh, but we have uh, uh, somewhat aggressively launched into most states in the country. In those states where we don't have uh, the ability to close on homes, we have um, secured kind of exclusive partners there. So we're really excited about, from a homeowner's perspective, creating a platform where we close all transactions and put them on the blockchain. And then from a title and escrow perspective, we put all docs onto the chain and the homeowner can have access to that in, in closing. We've, we've transacted over $4 billion worth of real estate on chain. And that number um, goes up every day, literally. So we're, we're quite proud of that. Um, that's kind of the five minutes on, on who Proppy is. I had a slide, but it talked about uh, the future of real estate and blockchain and crypto and NFTs, but I think this crowd probably would be a bit redundant if I taught you what crypto and blockchain was. So um, if we want, we can kind of open it up to questions on how properties um, automating the real estate platform, if that's what we'd like. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's do that. So everybody, if you have any questions, please uh, type it into the chat. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe first and foremost, could you give some uh, some background on 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 um, what your views are on NFTs compared to security tokens? <laughs> uh, is, how many times have people heard people say, "I'm not an investment advisor, nor do I represent any sort of SEC legal representation"? <clears throat> I could go on for hours about the SEC. I mean, anytime they, you know, the, we, I have a good friend, I have a, a client or a friend of mine who is a, a regulator for the SEC. He was actually in the cyber division. So he was qualified. It's, it's really funny because the SEC by and large still, still uses the Howey test or the Howey rule against most things, even cryptocurrency, which if you think about how archaic the using a 1950s citrus grove and comparing it to whether or not crypto is an investment is is pretty crazy when you think about it. I mean, the, the example itself is 70 years old and it was tracts of land in Florida. I, I think um, I think when you NFT a home and it's transferred owner to owner, that that will not be an SEC issue. So if I, if I buy the house from you, Jonas, and it's uh, an NFT and I bought it as in one party and we've, we've just basically automated the traditional real estate transaction, that won't be an SEC issue. But if you look at some companies that have taken homes, tokenized them into multiple pieces, even down to the $50 increments, such as Lofty AI on the Algorand chain, that is an SEC um, investment. And that's my opinion. And I listen, I'm a, I'm a big fan of lofty AI. I own uh, uh, pieces of multiple houses all across the Midwest. Um, but the one thing I do think about the SEC is they're actually pretty good that if, if they do make a ruling and there's some companies that are on the wrong side of that ruling, they're pretty reasonable in letting those companies rectify those issues. So that's why I think you see a lot of companies erred on the side of aggressiveness, just in going what they think might be in the gray area, but they're going for it because the SEC is is slow to rule. But make no mistake to your 100 participants here, I'm not an SEC uh, expert. I, I focus on traditional real estate um, in the sense of, of one buyer to one buyer with a realtor involved. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so you are getting spammed with uh, questions. There is a lot. That's good to see. Uh -huh. Um, what one ask if there's any secondary market uh, on probably and how does it work? Yeah, so our, our goal is to become the open sea of real estate. And we have over a thousand homeowners who've, who've, who've actively raised their hand and said, hey, Adam, hey, property team, we'd like to sell our home as an NFT. You know, from 
and I'll, I'll maybe give you two minutes on how it works. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting. The average home closing in the States takes around 46 days. With us, it's wallet to wallet in minutes, but that's that's how the funds transfer, but the actual process takes a little bit longer. But if I was to NFT my home here in Missouri, I would get the relevant uh, legal documents that said the home is owned free and clear. It is what it said it is. I have no debt encumbrance. I put those into the NFT. I place the home into a corporate entity. In Missouri, we'd probably use an LLC, place it into an LLC. Within that LLC, that there's paperwork that says that the LLC has no debt, the home has no debt, et cetera, et cetera. We put an appraisal, put an inspection report in there. You know, NFT or tokenizing of the home is it's not it's not built for lack of transparency. It's actually built for quite the opposite. It's to create the most transparent real estate transaction ever. And so from a seller's perspective, I'm putting all these things in NFT. I meant it. And I let the world know, hey, here's my house. Here's how I'm selling it. Here's everything you would need to know about it, even down to a CMA, an inspection report, whatever you might need. From a buyer's perspective, that's pretty transparent. I can see what the house looks like for an inspection. What is it appraised for? If I'm getting a loan against that, I could show it to my financial backing. Hey, this is what the appraisal looks like ahead of time before I even make an offer. But even from a timing perspective, let's say I'm a, a cash buyer, in this case, crypto buyer, but my wallet has funds. If I know you're selling your house on July 1st, and I know that I'm having a corporate relocation or my lease is up, or I need to move in July because my kids only have a 30-day window between schools, the NFT of homes puts the power back into the seller and the buyer's hands. Because if I put an offer in on the house on July 1st, now it's it's usually a 40-day window of negotiation, negotiating back and forth, sending my inspector in, sending my appraiser in. And then a lot of times that's when the real negotiation starts. And so for the ability for the seller to, to be transparent up front, hey, this is what my house is, this is what it looks like. And then the buyer to be able to see that and say, hey, the house is going for sale on this date. If I want to buy the house, I transfer wallet to wallet. There's still title and escrow there for oversight to make sure one party can't take advantage of the other. But in terms of ease of use, it's very powerful. And if you think about everything now is, is based on ease of use, you get your groceries delivered, you can get your car delivered, you can find your suitable significant other on apps without having to leave your house. The thought of you know, being able to kind of transact in a way that best suits you using whatever funds, whether they're crypto or traditional, that best suits you, that resonates with a lot of homeowners. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Adam. And, and if you have time, uh, I see there are lots of questions Let's directed do it. towards you. Um, but everybody, it would be really good if you could ask it in the Q&A and then simply type Adam first so that we know it's for Adam specifically. But yeah, Adam, if you have any time, that would be good. Yeah, um, I got Good point. And hope to see you at the fireside chat at the end or in a bit, actually. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Next presenter is uh, Jake Menner, who is the uh, CFO of Renewal Blocks. Um, Jake has been in crypto since 2020 and specializes in security token structure, company operations, and financial operations. Uh, along with Renewal Blocks, Jake is also a project manager for Dwell Homes, a custom home building company in the US. Uh, and now Jake will talk a bit about uh, Renewal Blocks. So um, Jake, welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Jonas. Um, I appreciate you guys having me on today. I'm really excited to talk about Renewal Blocks. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Awesome, all right, let's get started. So. I'll just reiterate, uh, my name is Jake Menard. I am Chief Financial Officer of Renewal Blocks. Renewal Blocks is a Bitcoin mining company that is striving to use 100% renewable energy. And we are also going to be offering our company's equity through security tokens on the Ravencoin blockchain. So let's start off with what is Renewal Blocks? Renewal Blocks is going to be the world's ex first exclusively renewable immersion cooled Bitcoin mining farm that will be tokenized on the Ravencoin blockchain. Now, there are a few things to touch on here. The first thing is uh, being exclusively renewable. So from the get-go, we are going to be mining Bitcoin using 100% renewable energy, which we do recognize <laughs> is the, bless you, <laughs> which we do recognize is the trend that the, um, that the sector is going to, which is all renewable energy. Immersion cooled means we will be utilizing a new technology called immersion cooling, 
which will offer, offer us a competitive advantage over other Bitcoin mining companies. And I will touch on immersion cooling in a later slide. Um, the tokenization aspect means we are going to be uh, representing uh, renewable access equity through security tokens on the Ravencoin blockchain. And for those of you that don't know, the Ravencoin blockchain is a fork of Bitcoin. Uh, Ravencoin allows for tokens to be built on layer one, so no solution needed for layer two. And the Ravencoin blockchain also allows us to create these tokens without a smart contract. So we don't have to risk ourselves uh, with the vulnerabilities that smart contracts um, seem to have these days um, sometimes. So we are also able to manage the transfer and payment of the security tokens to DigiShares and to anyone that self custodies through Ravencoin's UTXO model. So why Renewablox over other Bitcoin mining companies? Um, on the Bitcoin mining side, we're using 100% renewable energy. We are looking to focus on solar energy and anaerobic digestion, which is basically crop and animal waste that is being turned into electricity. We will also be using immersion cooling. And with the combination of these two things, we are gaining a competitive advantage over other companies that are air cooling their Bitcoin miners, as well as using solely grid power instead of uh, renewable energy. Now, the part of renewable blocks that we really think sets us apart is the security token offering. So we are going to be doing our security token offering through the DigiShares platform, which we are very excited about. Um, so the security token offering is allowing investors to basically become a Bitcoin miner without purchasing an ASIC or doing any external hosting. They are also able to choose their own level of investment uh, through their purchase of the security tokens. So however much security tokens you own, you will own that percentage of renewable blocks. And we are looking to keep the security token supply at a fixed amount after the funding round is completed this year. Also, instead of investing in depreciating ASIC equipment, um, you're able to invest in appreciating renewable block security tokens. And this is because of the, of the fixed supply. And we're also focusing on reinvesting 25% of all mined Bitcoin back into the company for us to uh, invest in more equipment and mine more Bitcoin. All right, so let's talk about what immersion cooling really is. So immersion cooling is basically an enclosure that has uh, this dielectric fluid in this enclosure and the ASICs are submerged in this fluid. So this fluid, this fluid uh, keeps the Bitcoin miners cool, keeps them uh, lubricated, and it also lowers the maintenance we have to do on these miners. Uh, immersion cooling also allows us to basically lower our power usage while maintaining our hash rate. Um, and if anyone doesn't know what hash rate is, it is the, uh, you know, the calculations that your uh, Bitcoin miner is doing per second in order to secure the blockchain and mine Bitcoin. So because we are able to maintain the hash rate while lowering power, we're able to stay competitive on the Bitcoin network while spending less on power. So let's, let's discuss uh, what advantages the security token offering has over um, other methods of basically obtaining Bitcoin. So mining at home, you have to purchase the ASIC, which uh, could be a minimum investment of $10,000 or more sometimes. The ASICs are very noisy um, because of how powerful they are. So you have to find a way to, to manage that noise. Uh, you have to know how to basically manage the power uh, and power draws um, and the infrastructure for that. You also have to have a lot of knowledge of setting up the ASICs, have knowledge of mining pools, have knowledge of a bunch of other things, including the effort of doing all this. Um, and also, the external hosting portion of this, uh, usually there's a loss of margin when externally hosting. So what does the renewable block security token eliminate um, for the investor? It eliminates the, the, the effort, eliminates the, the massive cost. Basically, you're able to mine Bitcoin hassle-free through your own level of investment, which is just however many security tokens you choose to own. So. On the left side here, we can see a visualization of a depreciating ASIC. So every three to five years, there's usually new ASICs that come to the market. Um, and that really lowers the efficiency of the older models. And your ASIC, uh, I guess, value trends towards zero. Um, the lifespan is also typically very short because of the, uh, especially if it's air cooled, just because of the uh, maintenance, the air pollution that gets into the miners. Um, so you have to take very good care of them. So typically their values trend to zero over time. On the right side, we can see a visualization of the appreciation of the renewable block security tokens and 
like I said before, this is because of the fixed supply aspect of the security token, which is representing the ownership of renewable blocks. And because we are going to be uh, reinvesting 25% of Bitcoin back into um, the company, we're adding value over time. And also the Bitcoin is being proportionally distributed to the token holders based on how many tokens they hold. So if you ended up owning 10% of renewable block security tokens, you will be distributed 10% of Bitcoin that we mine every quarter. So lastly, I wanna to touch on um, renewable blocks' compliance with the United States SEC. Um, a security token offering isn't you know, typically an ICO from five years ago where there's a lot of unregulated risk um, in investing in these companies and these projects. So the SEC knows who we are. We are filing Regulation CF, which is Regulation Crowdfunding. This covers US investors and we have a $5 million limit every 12 months uh, for funding. We are also filing Regulation S, which covers international investors. And then um, the other thing that we need to make sure is the uh, management of the assets and the security tokens. So the Ravencoin Restricted Assets offers uh, functions that are like KYC and transfer restriction, which is the freezing of addresses. Now the KYC is important so that if anyone ever chooses to do self-custody in the future, they are able to while by us tagging their addresses with a KYC tag so that these address, these, these tokens only go to these addresses specifically. Um, and the transfer restriction or, or the freezing of addresses allows us to comply with the 12 months trading freeze after the conclusion of a crowdfund. Um, we will be crowdfunding via FINRA approved platform, which we are looking to be DigiShares. And also our investor asset management is going to be on the DigiShares platform. And uh, that'll be all. Thank you so much, uh, Jake. Um, very, very good and good to uh, be working with you. That's exciting. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, let's... Um, go to uh, today's uh, last presenter, who's uh, Kylie Blazon, uh, the C CEO of uh, Stoke. Um, Kylie uh, is educated at Harvard University Business School and Western Michigan University Cooley. Um, and law school in corporate uh, law and finance and taxation. Uh, she brings a unique skill set to guide Stoke uh, through the complex legal uh, and compliance issues facing blockchain companies in the uncharted regulatory digital age. And now she'll present a case study on NFTs versus security token and their utilization in the real estate space. So um, yeah, welcome, Gailey. I believe you are muted. There we go, all right. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will be discussing today NFTs versus security tokens in the context of digitalizing and tokenizing real estate. So some simple housekeeping here. The information I'll be pro providing in this presentation does not and is not intended to constitute any legal or tax advice. Rather, all information is for general educational or and or informational purposes only. So to provide a bit of relevance as to what I'm gonna be discussing, um, here's a little bit about Stoke. We're a consulting firm for digitalization of asset-backed securities. We have an ATS platform, alternative trading system, which is currently in the FINRA and SEC regulation process. This is a multi-chain, multi-wallet platform that also has the ability to transact non-fungible tokens, NFTs, as we've discussed immensely thus far. Um, the Stoke platform is essentially a bifurcated platform. So there's security tokens that will be all custodian-based, whereas the NFT side of the platform is a peer-to-peer -peer DEX or a decentralized exchange. In addition to providing users with the destination for these transactions, uh, we also consult customers or clients on the digitalization, tokenization, capital raise using digital assets and or the tr um, transfer of assets. Uh, relevant here would be specifically um, real property. So some of the benefits to the digitalization and tokenization of real estate 
Um, this has somewhat been touched on, so I'll keep it a little bit general and short. Um, there are several benefits to this process. Um, it increases liquidity, enhances transparency. Um, there's a greater access to the market um, as it widers the investor. I'm sorry, it widers the investor pool. So to domestic and foreign, to in, institutional and retail investors. Um, and then there's also Im, immutable proof of ownership as all these transactions are reflected on the blockchain. Um, this is lower transaction costs and uh, frictionless transfers as well. So there are definitely some challenges to the digitalization and tokenization of real estate. Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but um, there's legal uncertainty in this in this area, along with um, ambiguous regulatory framework. Um, there are some tax implications, as I had just mentioned, tokenizing real estate, it does widen the investor pool. So this is on a global scale. This is something to be wary of. There may be certain tax implications when dealing with foreign purchasers or investors. Um, as, oops, jump the gun there, give me a second. Uh, yeah, but as uh, Klaus mentioned at the very beginning, this space is becoming more regulated. So however, there are certain uncertainties, uh, um, clarity is progressively beginning to be provided at both the federal and state levels. So clarity is, is great for this area as we move forward. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, we consult clients on the digitalization and tokenization of assets, including real estate. Um, this could be companies, individuals, owners, developers of real property. Our advice and assistance in this process is based upon the customer's objective. So we pick the vehicle based on that objective, whether it be utilization of an NFT or the issuance of security tokens. So essentially, if you take nothing out of my presentation today, uh, the important thing to understand here is that there is a distinct difference between NFTs and security tokens. So for instance, a uh, client seeking to simply transfer title to real property. Now this can be accomplished with an NFT. Um, this has already been discussed a little bit. Um, Adam alluded to it as uh, property is doing this, this pretty successfully. So I don't really wanna go into to detail, but essentially the asset being the real, real estate in this case uh, would be held in SPV, um, special purpose vehicle. So an LLC and the ownership of the LLC is represented by the NFT. Um, as for royalties, which is also discussed in this area in specifically in regards to NFTs, um, in short, the smart contract associated with NFT can be written as such. There are royalties that, that will be paid to whomever the owner designates, including themselves. Um, thus, a, a transfer of title can, can be accomplished in this manner. Conversely, if uh, a customer was interested in liquidity or raising capital, we should go the security token route, um, i.e. tokenizing of the real estate. So tokenization of a real estate is the process of creating tokens that represent fractional ownership in the real estate. So unlike an NFT, security tokens possess the fungibility and transferability traits of crypto, so like Bitcoin or ETH, but Unlike Bitcoin or ETH, it also provides intrinsic value because of the underlying asset. So with security tokens, there are parameters such as rules and guidelines and restrictions that are coded into each security token through a smart contract. And these vary depending on the standard chosen. So whether it be an ERC-1400 or an ERC-3643, um, this is not something I'm gonna get into detail on, uh, nor do I have the explicit ex expertise to speak on these different standards. But we have a tech team devoted to those, those discussions. Um, but also mentionable, uh, these security tokens are built to be regulatory compliant and are constructed with 
safety features such as reissuance of lost or stolen tokens. So both sides of the transaction are whitelisted. So if you lose your private key or are hacked, the tokens can be burned and reissued. Um, as I mentioned earlier, NFTs have the ability to assign royalties. Although currently the security tokens don't contain royalties, Stoke is actually in the process of developing a smart contract for security tokens that contain royalty. Again, this is any technical questions beyond what I just mentioned is not it's not quite my expertise. So as I mentioned a moment ago, um, a client comes to Stoke with the objective of improving liquidity. Liquidity being a buzzword in this particular topic, uh, it's simply referring to the ease at which an asset can be bought and sold. Um, it's, it's a buzzword here when discussing the digitalization of real estate because real estate is an illiquid asset. And this traditionally is a deterrent from investment in real estate, the illiquidity of the asset. So tokenization or creating security tokens for that real estate can recapture some of the value lost to the illiquidity discount by making the real estate, um, to by making the real estate investment easier to buy and sell. So alternatively, um, with let's say a customer comes to us with a fundraising objectives, this, this can also be accomplished through tokenizing the real estate. From a customer standpoint, tokenizing the asset allows the owner or developer to, I guess, the ability to raise capital more efficiently. They are selling the security tokens that represent the fractional ownership in the property and thus in return raising capital for a project, whether it be an existing or in progress project or a new idea. So very analogous to crowdfunding. And then from an investor, investor perspective, this provides access to private real estate investments, transparency, there's now a low, lower barrier to entry as the investors can invest a small amount of capital. Um, and then yes, again, uh, access to liquidity. So I mean, everything I said is great and all, but it's definitely important to remember that tokenization of real estate and NFT are highly complicated processes both technically and legally. So as such, um, careful consideration should be given when, when and before creating NFTs or issuing real estate backed security tokens. So among many legal considerations, uh, security tokens in respect to, to tokenizing and fractionalizing ownership in real estate, um, as we just discussed, will almost always qualify as securities under state and federal securities laws. I know this has been touched on, um, so I won't dive into too much detail, but um, as, as securities, they must be registered with the SEC or fall under an exemption from registration. Important to know as NFTs, um, as for NFTs, those, those don't typically qualify as securities, but util utilization in the NFTs in real estate, it might depending on the situation. Um, Adam alluded to this earlier. Um, so for instance, if you're fractionalizing an NFT, you may have a securities issue. Or additionally, if an NFT is backed by income producing property because of the management aspect of that, there is potential for a security issue there. Um, uh, but essentially, as I mentioned, Real estate backed security tokens and certain scenarios with NFTs are required to be registered with the SEC or fall under an exemption from registration. Most people take the latter route as registration is quite burdensome. Um, depending on the qualifications, of course, some exemptions include Reg D, Reg A, Reg CF, um, which is Regulation Crowdfund. And that about concludes my presentation today. I know I didn't have a whole lot of time and I touched on a lot of areas, but essentially it's important to note the difference between using NFTs in real estate and security tokens and the implications of each from a practicality standpoint and from both technical and legal perspectives.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kylie. Very good. Uh, very good presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so you were the last presenter, and uh, now we just have the fireside chat. So if all the today's presenters would uh, join the stage, that would be great. Jonas, you didn't tell me you're going to have a Harvard-educated lawyer on after me. I would have said a lot more. I would probably said a lot less things if you'd have told me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, actually, um, building upon what Kylie said, um, I think it would be good um, just um, to hear your uh, view, Adam, on, on security tones. Do you believe is that some, something probably would look into? Do you see a market for it? Or yeah, what's your view on it? It's probably the number one question we get is, can you help tokenize my real estate? And if we get 10 people to ask the question, I think eight of them probably understand it. The other 20% don't really quite get it. Um, we, we avoid it just because we think it's going to clearly fall within SEC jurisdiction. Um, and we think there's a lot of low hanging fruit on just the traditional real estate transaction being... Um, smoothing that out and automating, bringing more transparency. There's also a lot of people that I think by, they think their thought process is if I tokenize this, I can get more than it's really valued at. And that's probably my biggest frustration within kind of this world is if an asset is worth X, just because you tokenize it or have the ability to let more people invest in it, it's still worth X. And if you think you're going to get more from it, just because you can kind of fractionalize ownership, it's probably the wrong way of looking at this beautiful technology. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, let's, uh, Jake, what, what do you view on that? Do you agree or? No, I, I definitely agree on that. Um, one of the things I like to talk about when it comes to real estate tokenization uh, is this the illiquidity of the, you know, legacy real estate. Um, just because my father lived through the 2008 recession uh, and, you know, couldn't, can't get rid of properties. So it, I, it is low hanging fruit, right? It's, it's, it's obvious, um, but the value has to be there in the ownership of the properties, not really the uh, transfer, uh, not really trans transfer because the transfer is the easy part, the ownership and, and basically legally uh, structuring the fractionalized ownership of, of the properties and, and any real estate I think is, is the most important part. Being able to lower the barriers of entry is, is what needs to be focused on. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, okay, so there, there are tons of questions, so we're probably not going to make or uh, go through all of them, but I have one here for Adam and Kylie. Are there any methods or arrangement uh, arrangements that can be used to be able to sell a home NFT that has a first line mortgage that can be paid off as a part of the closing as it's currently done in a traditional closing process? I don't know if any of you are able to answer that. It's also listed in the Q&A at the bottom if, if you want to have a look at it. Oh, maybe Kylie has an answer. We haven't figured it out yet. Because I was, was going to say, Adam, you might want to take over this question. <laughs> well, you know, okay. that's, that's, the, that's the issue is, you know, an NFT transfer is, is in real time. That's what, you know, it's wallet to wallet with. It's a trustless environment. If you have a third party who has you know, encumbrance on your house, you technically don't even own it. So there's a lot of trust that comes into that trustless transaction. So we, we haven't seen it yet, but I, but I think it's, it's going to, it's evolving very, very quickly. If you look at DeFi lending and the way that they've approached web three and real estate, by far the smartest players in the game feel like the, they're mostly on the DeFi lending side. So they've, they've gotten very aggressive as we all saw last couple of weeks, maybe a bit too aggressive, but they, uh, they will figure that out quite quickly. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and, and staying within uh, mortgages, um, so would it be possible to, to um, tokenize existing mortgages, um, either using NFTs or security tokens? Um, I don't know, Kylie, do you have anything to add there? So the question being, is it possible to NFT existing mortgages? Or, or security tokens, using security tokens. Um, yeah, I, I believe that would be possible. I think that 
there might be some legal implications to that as well. Um, I yeah, I don't have a I don't have an exact answer to that. <laughs> no, no, no. But no. I think I, I think it's I, I love when a lawyer says there might be legal implications. There's definitely a lot of legal, and you could tokenize anything. But it's you know yeah. I get this question all the time. Why you know if if you have a debt load that you want to tokenize and and reduce or mitigate you know reduction of assets or 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 issues of uh, encumbrance, then that might be you could you could tokenize anything. I just don't know why you would. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. There has to be a reason. Can we talk about Elizabeth's sons going to college with Gucci flip-flops? Can we talk about that? Are we all going to not talk about her 18-year-olds going off to Stanford, some beautiful school with Gucci flip-flops? Are we going to not discuss that at all? <laughs> I don't know. Are we, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, are we going to talk about this? <laughs> I'm just saying that the flex is real. And, it and, it's, and, it's, and, and the digital flex is going to be really real, too. And so, um, you know, yeah, culture matters. Can I ask you a question, Elizabeth? Sure. How do you think, what do you think the convergence of, in, of metaverse and gaming? I, I hear a lot of people, I'm a big, I don't want to tell you my opinion because people have heard enough of me. The convergence of gaming and metaverses, I see companies that don't even apply the two but they feel like they're kind of all in one to me is there, do you have an opinion on that yeah i mean so what what you're talking about is the play to earn so playing so playing games to earn cryptocurrency a la axis infinity um and that's where like when i showed the howie test which is um you're making money off of other people's actions but in you know, play to earn or learn to earn all these things, you're making money off of your own actions, right. uh, you know? So I think, but, but, but the, the explosion of play to earn games where real currency. So instead of getting like Robux, like that you get in Roblox, which are just in-game assets only, eventually I think those, there will be an exchange that will make those right. real, um, but I think there's, I think it's just massively huge. So I have a project that I want to share that, uh, that I'll just put in the, a link in there, but it's about civic engagement. So it's, you get, you are uh, encouraged based on civic engagement um, and get tokens for that. Thanks. And Jake, you have something to add? Yeah, I, I heard a quote the other day from, some, from someone speaking. I was, I was watching something and it was about play to earn games. Um, so Elizabeth, I'd love to hear you just kind of touch on this and see what your thoughts are. Uh, they kind of had a thought experiment on play to earn games. It was, if you gave all of your players a million dollars, would anyone still play your game? Um, because if they do play your game, you're successful in creating an entertaining, entertaining game. If they don't continue to play your game, that means you created a job um, and no one wants to play a job. So uh, I guess I want to get your thoughts on, on that quote right there. Well, I mean, I think um, I will share the documentary on Axies Infinity, um, and it's a little bit old because it was sort of seen in uh, the Philippines as a place where, you know, I, sometimes I say the reason why there's such a shortage of workers is because they're all building the metaverse and they're all working in the metaverse because they don't want to unload containers. They'd rather, you know, sit at a computer and, and push, a, push a button. Um, but um, now the hierarchy has happened where, because like to buy an Axie, you have to, you know, it's a character thing. Um, you have to have $300 and then you play that thing. Well, so what's happening is rich people are buying the $300 Axie and getting poorer people to do the playing, which is the work. And so it's sort of like sort of reinstantiating, uh, you know, power reinstantiating itself and not sort of that division that we had where, you know, so yes, I think that's a really great point. I haven't heard that quote, but I I like it. Yeah, I, I, it's a good point, Elizabeth. It's in some of those, you know, avatars to buy are even more money and it creates this kind of backwards cast system, which is really unhealthy, which is the antithesis of what we're trying to accomplish with Web3 and emerging technology. But I, I, still, I still haven't figured out, and maybe you can help me with this, Elizabeth, where the social aspect of meta is i see the gaming aspect of it i see the 50 percent of chain last year was involved around gaming 
but I don't, I don't know how boomers like me, how will I spend a tremendous amount of time on the metaverse? I haven't figured that out yet. Well, yeah. Um, well, this right now is just sort of a, a bad version of the metaverse. So this is, this is work that you're doing right now. And if, if it could be uh, envisioned to be better, if we had glasses on and you were walking around in your kitchen and you could see us, but you could also, you know, clean your kitchen while you're talking to us or, you know, or if it was much more engaging and we could walk around and kind of meet each other afterwards. So I think that, that you will work more in the metaverse at some point in time, but, you know, it might be something that just the younger generation kind of, you know, builds up and we just sort of fall off. Also, Elizabeth, I would like to know, I, I did uh, cut your presentation short, but you, you told us to apply our minds to utility within um, uh, tokenization of properties. Do you have any um, examples of how you could apply utility to uh, real estate tokenization? I don't know if you have gone through it, but um, maybe. No, I mean, that's kind of what I'm starting to think about right now. But like when you think about a smart city, so you've got a smart, a, a smart city, meaning a city that, um, you know, responds to your physical presence or whatever. But um, I think that uh, simulations of and predicting the future um, would be really interesting. I also think like uh, uh, just like you can um, allow your data to be used for a research project, you could say, allow me to be tracked through the smart city and I will you know, anonymize data, but I will receive um, currency for that. Um, and um, I don't know, like, I guess it's like thinking about replicating your house um, and then thinking about maybe you know, revisualizing -visual what it would look like if you added a second story versus if you didn't, you know, just much more immersive um, and visualization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also a question here um, related to um, borrowing. So there are certain uh, DeFi protocols which allows you to take out a loan if you uh, post collateral. And um, I would like to know if any of you think that's that's going to be possible with properties in the future, either um, in the form of NFTs or uh, security tokens. So simply take out a loan against um, your token, essentially. Yeah, we, we just launched a partnership with Abra, um, one of the top DeFi lenders out there. And they're already doing all the things you mentioned. You can borrow against crypto assets, NFT assets. Um, quite easily and quite aggressively. So it's that's that's alive and well. Yeah, based on that, I think it's important to note that they're able to borrow against crypto right now. And crypto fluctuation is vast. So now borrowing against a security token that is backed by a real world asset, that gives a little bit more of a credible valuation to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't want to borrow against my UST, Kylie? No, definitely not. I'll give you a good deal. <laughs> I'll pass. Thank you, though. Okay. Um, I think also um, we have briefly touched on, on the legal aspects, and I also just want to hear your view, especially on NFTs. Um, I don't, or DD Shares don't currently deal uh, with NFTs. Um, but um, the process of tokenizing properties, I would assume it also involves a lawyer and it's not simply something you, you simply um, mint a token and then tokenize a, um, uh, a property. I would assume there are some legal steps that need to be considered. Um, could, could you shed some light on that, Adam? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's a quite an involved process uh you know you can't sell a house in open sea although people have tried because it's it's um the smart contracts and the nuance of it are much more developed than that so you have to take the house and put it into a corporate structure whether it's some states an llc some states it's a uh, an s corp or otherwise and within that corporate structure you place the house you place all the relevant documents you 
place all the title and escrow documents. You place the paperwork saying there's no debt encumbrance. And then you're actually NFTing that corporate structure. And within that corporate structure, there's a house. Because the issue with real estate and real-time transfer is municipalities are still quite involved, i.e., if you live in Indiana, the Marion County Recorder's Office still has to be involved. The state of Indiana is still involved. And so by putting it into a corporate structure that retains ownership, but just ownership of that corporate structure has changed, that's how we can NFT the property. And by doing it from one owner to the next owner, we, we kind of stay out of the SEC kind of gray area. And so it's, it's just an easier way to use smart contracts in exchanging home ownership in real time and kind of missing that 45 day window. Uh, and it's a very, very transparent way to do it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, so do, do you believe in the future, would it be possible to tokenize the title directly rather than having to go through an SPV structure? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm not a lawyer, but um, absolutely. I think the record of ownership on chain and being transparent and having all these different custodians of the data makes makes a tremendous amount of sense. Ironically, most closings of real estate go on to public record after the county touches them. So it's kind of an inverted funnel where a lot of people see the data, then it's got one little stop gap, and then it comes back out into the world. And it just makes so much more sense to have all property data on chain, closings on data, and closings on chain. Then the municipality, as they see fit, can go into chain, pull those records off for their data. The, the custodial aspect of the data around real estate is probably the most exciting. It's more exciting than people using Bitcoin or Ethereum to buy houses or stable coins to buy houses. The ability to share that data and be transparent. And you also have to remember there are a lot of developing countries where proof of ownership of homes are very challenging. And, you know, we're lucky here in the States because our title and escrow is basically bulletproof, but there's a lot of developing countries where that's not the case. And so for them to be able to close on chain, be able to retain generational wealth, generation home ownership rights is really interesting and, and, and much needed, honestly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so I actually think just um, here, here at the end, I would like to have your view on the future of, of real estate tokenization, just one at a time. So um, starting with you, Jake, maybe you can uh, give your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So currently, um, so in my bio that you, you stated earlier, I'm also a property manager, or not property manager, project manager for Dwell Homes. Uh, we build custom homes. Um, a couple of things we're looking at doing is building a rental uh, community or multiple rental properties and basically tokenizing dwell homes. Um, so I think that, and especially with the way home prices are trending higher and higher, and it's a lot harder for uh, new homeowners to come into the space, a lot more people are going to be renting. So I, I believe that uh, more so the real estate tokenization will, will trend towards um, companies tokenizing companies, uh, most likely security tokens um, that own these rental properties and people own a part of these companies and own uh, and, and basically get the rights to the profits of this company through the security tokens. I think that's where it's trending just because of the way home ownership is going. Um, over time, we see more and more rental um, properties just becoming a thing. Yeah, fully agree. Thank you for that. Um, and Elizabeth, maybe you can uh, talk about the yeah. metaverse, dig digital yeah. twin, stuff like that. What's the future? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that we will use some kind of uh, digital money or digital um, tokenizing to um, show ownership of our virtual worlds. Um, but I start, what I want to start to see, you know, like we said, is like, how do we enhance our in real life worlds with our virtual worlds? And will someone own the airspace or the metaverse space of your actual house? I mean, think about your actual house where you live and mirroring it. Uh, who owns that? And do you get rightful ownership of that? And, you know, what kind of simulations can you have? And can you invite your avatar friends over to your, you know, your avatar house? Um, you know, so there's interesting things, but then, you know, why would you want to um, apply you know, uh, real 
real life stuff or real life limitations to what your imagination is, you know, wouldn't you much rather have a really crazy wild house because you don't have to deal with uh, gravity and things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so it seems that we lost Adam and Kylie. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if they'll be back. So let's just uh, wrap it up. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to to all the presenters. Um, and also uh, all the 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 audience uh, you who have at, attended. That's uh, really great. Really much appreciated. Um, and also, I did see that in the chat, some of you asked uh, how they could reach uh, the presenters. Uh, I believe most of them can be found on social media. So maybe you can find them on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. I also just uh, want, you, want to thank uh, the, the tech team who made this um, webinar possible. And uh, finally, I just want to mention that we'll be doing a masterclass on real estate tokenization in Vienna in uh, two weeks on the 31st of May. So um, yeah, I also saw that Ashley had posted that in the chat. Um, so feel free to check that out. Hope to see you there. Um, but yeah, other than that, just uh, thank you to all and um, have a good day. Bye.